glory. Um, I know that the Bible teaches there's a great gap fixed, and uh, we can't go there and they can't come here. Um, but I, I'm telling you, I really believe that somehow, some way, God allows our dearly departed loved ones to to know the happy times of our lives, and somehow. I don't, I don't know. You won't find any Bible verse that says this, and, and it might mess with theology a little bit, but I just, I feel like there are times, my dad's been gone 10 years, and I just, I have felt there's times where, Dad, I just felt you smiling on me. I, I could just tell you, you just did something, you know, you pulled a few strings, and, and I don't know exactly how all that works. Um, that's not the topic tonight. We could easily, <laughs> could easily go down a rabbit trail, uh, but I really do believe that. And uh, actually, last year, my dad, he was a sinless God pastor, uh, 42 years Pentecostal pastor, um, but he was a diehard Baylor Bear fan, season ticket holder. They're Baptists, you know, Baylor. He, and uh, last year, Baylor for the first time in its history won the national championship in basketball and I thought, oh, okay dad, did you pull a few strings up there? I'm just being silly. Um, how is redemption defined? That, and that's what this is about, redemption. Here's the definition. The action of saving or being saved from sin, error, or evil a thing that saves someone from error or evil. That's the definition, but I love the second definition better. Redemption. I shouldn't say better. I'm, I love it equally. I love my sins being forgiven. That's, that's the biggie. That's number one. But number two is really good. The action of regaining, the action of regaining or gaining possession of something in exchange for a payment or clearing a debt. That's redemption. Um, there was a, a song that we used to sing when I was a kid, and I know you guys know it. Um, from our church, Homer Tarkington led it from his guitar and um, well, we were blessed, had a pretty good band at Homer. He's a pretty good guitarist, but he was up in years, and usually his guitar's a little bit out of tune, just enough to kind of raise those hairs on the back of your head. <laughs> and, and he pay, played this one note that I just thought, that doesn't fit with the song, but he did it. He forced it in there. But uh, he paid the debt. He did not owe. I owed the debt. I could not pay. Right? You remember that one? Yeah. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace. My Jesus paid a debt that I could never pay. Now he would play it. And at that one note, I just thought, oh, it doesn't fit. But anyway, that's his personal opinion. I love I loved you. Just, I'm really going... I'm really going astray here, but I want to tell you a funny. Uh, Homer Tarkinen was a man. He's about six foot seven, really probably six nine, but shrunk over by the years of six seven. Real tall man, strong, large pastor, and uh, he's known all over North Texas district. And one year at the uh, minister's council, they had asked him to sing a song. Uh, at, after the business session had ended and then there was a little break and then it comes back to do more business and there were some pretty heated things that were being discussed in the business session and Homer got up there to start the second round and they said, well, Brother Tarkin, they come and sing a song and, and he, he kind of do a little picking and grinning and, and he sort of do a comedy routine is what it was in between them. And, he, and he made this statement to all the pastors, he said, um, oh, Lord, help us, because uh, these preachers in here this morning, this business session, do, 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 do. they was as confused as a bunch of termites inside a yo-yo. 
<laughs> I'll, never, I'll never forget that, but anyway. That's really good. That's so, really beside the point. I'm going way off track. But Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Isn't that beautiful? Listen to that again. In Him, we have redemption through His blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of His grace. Redemption is an amazing thing. And this thought really carries over from the previous week um, as we're thinking about this story, this amazing story of Mark Miller, the lead singer of the, the band uh, Mercy Me, and his relationship with his dad. And he made a statement last week in, in that part of the teaching. I haven't forgotten. It stayed with me. I didn't like it when my dad started changing and becoming this godly person because he wasn't staying in his lane. We had our defined roles. I was the good guy. He was the villain. Now he's messing everything else, uh, messing everything up. And I wasn't quite ready for him to be saved, even though you know I prayed for him to be saved. I wanted him to be saved, but when it actually started happening, I really wrestled with it. And um, I know, I know many of us are that way, um, because we we all fall into defined roles in families. I, I, I'm the second oldest, you know, big brother. I, you know, kind of follow his lead, do what he does, you know. Um, Jamie played baseball. I played baseball. Jamie. Um, Bought a Camaro, I bought a Camaro. Jamie put an 8-track player in, in his car. I went and bought the exact same one, you know. Even Jamie had a back surgery. Well, I got me a back surgery too. <laughs> I'm joking, but I'm telling you now. Um, there, you know, in families, we kind of, we fall into predefined categories sometimes and, and I'll never forget that statement that the dad makes on here last week. If God can forgive everybody else, why can't He forgive me? Um, if you missed out on last week, I thought Oliver was really, really vulnerable. It was just a beautiful testimony. It's easy. Hey, it's easy to say, oh sure, God can even forgive the, forgive the sin of murder. Until it's you and your family and you. I, I got to tell you, um, on my son's journey, I've I've struggled with the individual that's named the co-defendant, the the one who's really guilty of the crime. I've, I've wrestled with it. I've, I've just man, I thought, why can't you just own up to it and tell the truth and that even. The detectives know, and they, I've watched all the interrogation videos and everything, and, and they know what really happened. But, but yet, in Zach's journey, while he's been in prison these seven years, I met Edgar. Um, Edgar was one of the guys Zach led to the Lord. It's an amazing testimony, delivered from drugs. Um, I mean, his his testimony is very, very bold. He he was he had strapped up and he's in prison with his improvised needle. He's getting ready to inject heroin, and he's done it for 15 years. He's been hooked on this stuff, and he put it in, and his body rejected it, and spit it across the room. He saw the drug go in, and he saw his arm spit it out, and he heard the voice of God say, "You will never use that drug again." Because he had started going to the Bible study. 
And he dropped to his knees and gave his heart to Jesus. And, and so Edgar, he's a bad dude. Um, he's got a big old scar right under his chin. And uh, I asked him, where'd that come from? And he said, uh, we were in a brawl. And uh, there's you know guys with clubs and chains. And, and I, I found myself in a really bad space. He said, I grabbed some wrought iron off of pool fencing, yanked it off, had a, a bar on it. Some of, some of us were fighting with this. He said, one guy has one. He jabbed it up in my chin. That's where that scar came from. But he was Mexican mafia. He has done a lot of horrible things in his life. And uh, But Edgar, Edgar got saved. And Tony, who is uh, from Poland, played uh, Division I hockey for Wisconsin University. Strong, hulking dude who had become a white supremacist and had a swastika tattooed on his head. And on his back, he has a tattoo from the neck all the way down to his waistline of Adolf Hitler in the Heil Hitler salute. That's, he was just a bad dude. Zach was able to lead him to the Lord. And, and then Edgar, Mexican Mafia, and Tony, white supremacist, now go to the same Bible study, and eventually they became cellmates. I mean, it just rocked the prison. It's like, this isn't supposed to be. And I was thinking about it one day. If I can accept Edgar, why do I struggle with feelings towards Ricky? You know, we're all of us. We're works in progress. And uh, we're praying God help us. But uh, redemption is real. So, obviously, redemption, it's not just enough to say, okay, I'll take three pounds of Jesus and add it into my order, please. You know? That's how some of us do. Yeah, I get saved, get redeemed. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to have some of that. You add it on to everything else that I've got in my order. But not enough of Jesus. And by the way, I'm quoting a famous poem. Three pounds of Jesus. Give me three pounds of Jesus, but not enough to make me love a black man. Not enough to make me care about the poor. Just three pounds of Jesus. As, you know, some people they think that's kind of how that's kind of how it works. I want to be redeemed, but I want to keep doing my thing too. And I know I'm not making light of it because. It has to. It requires a total change right. of heart, right? right? But having said that, anyone can be redeemed. Anyone can be saved. So I'm just wondering if any of you, like as you're watching the video, did did it stir anything inside? Is there anything you'd like to share? You know, we've got maybe we can talk about, but. For me, I've, I've enjoyed the most when we just have some comments and, and people share their life journey and just, you know, what what they've experienced. Anybody have any thoughts or observations at this point? Yeah, Shelly? I, I really love the part where he was talking about holding his dad, you know, being, being a hospice nurse and seeing those kind of moments so often that I get to, to experience. But when he had that, he... he gave us this picture of what it was like when his dad was literally holding on to him. And I just, in my mind, I could just picture it. And to me, that was just such a beautiful, that was like probably the most striking part for me for the whole video, was that particular moment. I thought that's where you were going with that, because I know you're a hospice nurse, and just, um, Shelly, that's, um, that's beautiful. I've always, Shelly loves kids, but she also loves um, aging individuals that are dealing with, with end of life. And those are two, like, the two opposite ends of the ex extremes. But that is beautiful ministry. It, it is, by the way, all of you who do medical and looking around the room, it is a calling. It's a ministry. And thank you, all of you. 
for that. Um, did I see another hand? Yeah, Oliver. You know what uh, Mark was saying about his dad saying, wait a minute, you're not supposed to be godly, that's me, you know, you're the basically the wicked one. And to a person that's been hurt, and then I can see how they do that. It's kind of like with Jonah, though. When Jonah went to the Nineveh, he went there to preach condemnation, basically, and repentance, hoping they would repent, you know, but you know what, I'm going to preach it anyway. And when they repented, he was in shock. Right. And that's where I wish he was in. I was right there. And, and, and I think um, what Jonah felt is what Mark felt. And, yeah. and what Mark felt is kind of like what I felt when I faced the killer. You know? Do I really want him to be? Mm -hmm. Boy, that's a hard, hard question to answer. Mm -hmm. Of course it's yes, but it's like it somehow it robs you of justice, yeah. wanting the redemption. And I think for Bart, it robbed him of justice. Wait a minute, now that you're saved, all these things just wash away? Where's my right. justice? Right, yeah. And I picture that 10-year-old boy being beaten so bad that he's laying on his stomach, he can't lay on his back. Um, and don't you think, now this might be, I, I don't know if, if you're there yet on this kind of conversation, but for me, I think that God is not disturbed or bothered by someone wrestling through that. Like being honest with him and saying, who do you think you are? You're the bad guy. You, you know, I've got so much anger. And, but now God won't allow us to stay there. And He wants growth in us. But I don't, I don't think that the Lord... We humans are so, we, it's so clear cut for us on some things and get your act together and forgive and accept, but, but the Lord is so patient at, as, long as, as long as we're bring, being brought along, as long as we're willing and we keep praying and we keep saying, Lord, you have to work on my heart. Um, but that, yeah, that's, that's very beautiful. Was it you, Larry? Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, it first brought to mind with me was, you know, the older people, like well, I guess who have lost our parents. When I think about him having those just those last two or three years with his dad, where they were actually on good terms, uh -huh. uh, I think about how it would be for us. How much we should be spending more time with our aging parents than we do, because I know me and Dale have talked about it many times. How we wish we could relive the last. 10 years of time with her folks mm -hmm. and with my mom. And I just think about that. That's what brought to mind for me was that these young people don't know what they've got now, yeah. and they will someday. That's just good advice for all of us. I mean, I look around the room, probably most of us get that. But um, I wish every kid back in that room could. You know what? The Asian culture is way better at honoring the age, the older ages, than in American culture. Um, I mean, it, it's whatever it takes, you know, moving my home, but I will sacrifice whatever to honor him. I was just thinking as you were talking, of course, Stephanie's dad went to be with the Lord last year, 2020. How precious um, about five and a half years, maybe six years, that Jerry was able to sit with Zach week after week. I mean, if, if there's any blessing about being in prison, I mean, that's something that you can't replicate that. I don't know if he was just a typical 20-something. I don't know if he would take time to sit with his grandfather week after week after week. And just to hear him pouring into him, you know, Jerry had been a district leader, a presbyter, he had been a pastor, an itinerant evangelist, had started at the flaming age of 16, traveling in ministry, and, um, pastored stateside for 26 years, then goes off to be a missionary for a better part of 20 years, maybe more than that, and became um, the area director for the entire 
uh, all of the seven nations of Central America. And yet he told us my most important ministry was the last five years. Man, it's, uh, so I, I miss him. I know Stephanie does. But we're so blessed. And then I was thinking about um, when my dad died. Uh, that was in 2011. And um, in July of 2010, um, I had the blessing of going and spending seven days with him. We thought, we thought it was the end. We thought he was dying. And um, in fact, the church family was so gracious. People gave towards me going to just be with Dad. It was an incredible blessing. And during um, seven days and six nights in the hospital with him, and I stayed with him in the room, and um, some of the most precious memories were the embarrassing moments where he's like, I hate that you have to do this for me. And I was like, Dad, I'm honored to help. You know what I'm talking about? Some of the nurses know the things, just the things that happen. And it, I still, to this day, I remember some of the precious, amazing stories that he told me that I had never heard my whole life during those six days. I don't know how we got off on that, but that is so, it's so important, so, so important. Now, somebody else raised your hand. Who, who had a hand up? Was it you, Billy? Okay. I didn't have my hand up. Billy and then Becky? Okay. I was just going to say, I kind of, I love this, um, the movie of it. When we got home, if you ever want to show it, maybe at the end of this series or something. Uh, but I kind of relate with him because my, my uh, biological father, he was, a drunk, womanizing, non provisional uh, cruel mm -hmm. man, too. He'd go to work, work all week, get paid on Friday night. He'd come home drunk and bring a bunch of his friends in with him, guys and gals. And uh, I can still remember the night he forced me to take my first drink of beer, and I didn't want it. Wow. He slapped me and <laughs> pulled me back up and forced me to take a drink. I finally took it. Then, that made me sick, but after that, then I was on the road then uh, in my later years, uh, becoming an alcoholic, but I thank God I never did get to that car. Well, uh, yeah, the, the, that's so touching. But I was, I was uh, in my adult thing, so I didn't know where, what happened to me. Where I figured I knew probably where he was. I uh, started to look around my other relative in the area or whatever, my mom, and I find out where he was, and I was able to develop a, a he reconciled to him somewhat in the end. He was still a mess. But, yeah. Uh, like Dennis Quaid in the movie. He was, yeah. Uh, he was a dirty, mean, cruel, hard-looking man, but I, I still travel all the way back to Missouri to see him and get back there and I treat him like he's my favorite buddy. Mm -hmm. And he's, he's got died and gone on now, but I'm glad I was able to get back with him and let him know there's no hard feelings. Mm -hmm. There was another time my mom told me about it. He came in drunk one night with some of his friends and he woke me up and uh, <coughs> got me to cry and he got mad and said, shut that something or another up. And, I wasn't shut. He couldn't get me to quit crying. Mom said he went in. He went in, picked me up, and bounced me off the wall, clear across the room. She said she went wow. in the kitchen, got a butcher knife, stuck his throat. She ever touched that kid again? I'll kill you. Wow. Said he didn't come home wow. for a week. He, he knew he wouldn't. Thank God for mom. Yeah. And then when he did Thanks come back home, he made sure that she was asleep first. I tell you what, it, it's amazing that uh, the stories that people of our church family have been through things that you. And I'm proud of you for for reaching out to your dad and extending that kindness to him. You're you're a great fella. That's really an awesome thing. You mentioned about um, don't know if we'd ever share show the movie here. We've seen it. A lot of you have. There's you get into copyright laws and things like that. There's uh, pretty particular uh, rules about what what videos can and cannot be shown and how you get licensed for them. But maybe someday. 
Interestingly, if you did see the movie, you, you're probably like uh, me, I'm sure Stephanie's the same way, like you watch it and go, oh, well they didn't quite depict it that way in the movie, and this is slightly different, but you realize that it's, it's intended to, to tell a story, but um, I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie uh, from, that was based upon the book, The Shack, and I know that um, yes, a lot of people really have real issues with it. I personally loved it. I don't think they were intending to say that, the, you know, that the Holy Spirit was a female or that God the Father could be a man or a lady. I think that there's, there's a beautiful skill to writing in a way to communicate things. And, uh, but uh, there's, a, there's a scene in the movie, the way they depict it, they show this little boy that's so terrified and uh, it's like, um, it's a vision that the main character is seeing. This vision of this helpless little boy that's so terrorized. And he just wanted to help that little boy so much. And then the individual that's, I, if I remember correctly, I think it was one playing the part of Jesus, says to him, well, that little boy, that's your dad. The mean, angry tyrant that you were so afraid of, who was so vicious to you, that's what he experienced as a little boy, and it made him think, I never thought of what it was like for him. What made him the way he is? And what made your dad the way he was? I mean, we, we're going to get to heaven someday, we'll have answers. I don't know, maybe, maybe some things we'll never have answers for, but hats off to you for doing the honorable thing, for being a godly man. Becky, you, you had your hand up. What do you want to share? When I was in my 20s and 30s, my mom and I didn't get along too well, but I made it a matter of prayer to, to pray for our relationship, you know. And then when we moved out, and I, I was, I could spend about half an hour of time, you know, before I started praying, I could spend maybe half an hour, and then we'd yell and I'd leave. <laughs> so, and, um, so, yeah, and then um, by the time Gordy and I got married, um, we were more at peace. And it was weird because I was like, I wish I could run away from home. <laughs> you know, because we were always, she'd call me like five times a day whether she needed to or not, even though we weren't getting along. And um, so when we finally got along, that's when we moved to the Southwest. And then um, this, you know, like four months before she did pass, we spent three weeks with her. And I'm just thankful for that time. And I'm thankful that my sister mentioned how you need to take lots of pictures. I remember you and Gordy traveling up to right at the Canadian border, right? Right. Yeah. She lived on this side, right? And your right. sister was on the other side and, and it was COVID and she couldn't come across or whatever. But um, yeah, those those are worthwhile investments. I, I bet that's very, very special through the years that you were able to grow to the point to have that level of friendship. They say that parenting is um, is like that. It, you know, it, it changes the role from being the parent to the child to then becoming friends. And then towards the later part of life, sort of a role reversal that, that the kids are now looking after the parents sort of a thing. And uh, um, what is the old saying? Child once, parent twice. I, I, maybe I butchered that. But, um, well, um, the, the concept of redemption. So I, I, I feel led to just stop and pray for a moment that if there's anyone in our circles who we have written off, I mean, just think about that. I mean, we all do that. We do this. We don't mean to necessarily. You know, we don't consciously say, well, that one's going to got a great chance to be saved. That guy over there, he'll never be saved. But we do that 
on a subconscious level um, about a year and a half ago on a Sunday morning uh, Leah gave a word about can't remember I can't remember all the details of of the message that she shared that morning but part of it had to do with this concept of being more open to accepting people and, and forgiving people right. and just accepting them where they are and just loving them where they are to bring them to Jesus. And, and anyway, as she was talking, um, and I told Mo and Leah this after church, I said, as you were talking, God convicted me because I have a neighbor who has just kind of gotten under my skin. He kind of annoys me, you know. I don't like his music and he likes it loud. And, you know, all the motors and loud noises and blah, 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 and, you know. And, um, and that morning as that word was going forward, um, I, you know, I was, I'm thinking, I don't like all of his kids running all over my property and their bikes and all, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then, and then the Lord just spoke to me as she was saying that, don't you realize that his family is identical to yours growing up? Whoa, we had five kids, we had a big family. <laughs> I was that kid. I, that's right, I was the kid that was rooting the strawberry patch next door. My neighbor was so upset about it. I'm such a hypocrite. And it, anyway, it changed me. And um, from that point, I've really begun to try to reach out. And since then, they've been here for church. And they just, Pastor Mo just did a funeral for their family. I was, it was our last visit with Zach and Nick, so I couldn't do it, but he did the funeral for them. And I'm amazed God's doing something. We're, we're seeing something happen. Um, I do want to pray in just a moment, but Diane, you Just real, real quick, yeah. one of our former pastors in Oregon, one of his famous sayings, and it's always stuck with me, is love them into wholeness. And I was sharing that with one of the sisters here. That's I great. won't get into it. Just dealing with some real family issues. And that's exactly what I told her. I said, not that you have to accept their way of life or whatever and so forth, but love them into wholeness. That's where you're going you're gonna to win them to Christ. That is well said. Yes. And we, and we don't have to be the judge that knows all the answers. And... Um, into wholeness. So in, in the bottom line, it just where the rubber meets the road, who deserves redemption? <laughs> well, not one of us. I mean, to be truthful, none of us are good enough. We don't deserve this wonderful grace that God gives. Amen. But He is so kind and so merciful. And he offers us redemption. So I, I want you to call to mind, maybe it fits or maybe it doesn't, but if you do have someone that you just sort of have written off, but they just keep, you keep finding yourself encountering them. They are in your circle of acquaintances. Maybe, just maybe, you're on assignment to them. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just take a moment to pause and ask you to give us sensors to recognize when your grace is be, being extended to individuals in a special way. It could be that perhaps the ones that we write off, you're wanting to write their name down in the book of life. And so, Lord, we, we just are so quick to judge, but it could be that there's an amazing transformation waiting to happen for them. And so, right now, we consciously just draw to our attention. We, we ask you, let it come to mind, the ones that you have placed in our path that uh, maybe we don't really hit it off with them super well. Maybe they, maybe they come across as harsh or just as though that there's no hope for them to ever change. They're set in their ways. Sometimes they might even be obstinate and angry about it. But I'm reminded right now that when the 
the worker for the rock goes and he, he sets the chisel to the stone, he might tap that stone with a hammer a hundred times and it doesn't break. But just all of a sudden, a hundred and one and it chips, it, it breaks, it falls off. The hard places break away. Even though it seems like individuals around us, maybe they're not listening, maybe they're disrespectful, perhaps they're even sarcastic about Christianity. They might even make fun of our views or our beliefs. But the reality is that it's like a chisel on a stone and it just we don't know when it's gonna break, but we just keep we just keep hitting them with love. We will just keep hitting them with love. We will, we will love them to wholeness. We choose to love them to wholeness. In the name of Jesus, amen.